Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. On the news hour tonight, a shakeup at the Department of Veterans Affairs. I speak to now former VA Secretary David Shulkin about what led to his departure and challenges ahead for the huge federal agency. Then mourning and protest in Sacramento. An unarmed black man shot to death by police is laid to rest amid calls for justice. Plus, a new museum exhibition draws attention to the role Native Americans play in our nation's identity. For most people, they don't see or really think about Indians, yet they're surrounded by Indian imagery, place names, and have connections with Indians on a kind of deep emotional level. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. A funeral today in a city on edge. Services were held in Sacramento, California for 22-year-old Stefan Clark. He was shot and killed by police earlier this month, leading to days of protests. We'll have the full story right after the news summary. In the day's other news, Russia retaliated for the expulsions of more than 150 Russian diplomats by the U.S. and other nations. Moscow tossed out the same number, including 60 American diplomats. It is also closing the U.S. consulate in St. Petersburg after the U.S. closed the Russian consulate in Seattle. This followed the poisoning of a former Russian spy in England. More funerals today in the Russian city of Kemerovo. A shopping mall fire killed 64 people there on Sunday. 41 of the dead were children. Today at a local school, teachers and classmates piled stuffed animals and hanged pictures of those they had lost. One woman accused officials of washing their hands of it and shifting responsibility. Families in Venezuela are demanding answers after 68 people died in a fire during a jail riot. It happened Wednesday in the town of Valencia in Carabobo State, 100 miles west of Caracas. Family members of inmates clashed with police outside the prison and officers fired tear gas. Today, people were still angry. There was a riot here. I came quickly. When I arrived, the cruelest news we received was that they burned them. They killed them. They assassinated them because they were locked up in a jail cell. They're not crazy enough to burn themselves. They were burned. They were killed here like dogs. The United Nations has called for a prompt investigation into the deaths. In Egypt, early estimates from this week's presidential election suggest incumbent Abdel Fattah el-Sisi will win 92 percent of the votes cast. But as ballots were counted today, state media reported that voter turnout was only about 40 percent. That is despite government payments and even threats. Nobel Peace Prize winner Malala Yousafzai returned to Pakistan today. It was her first visit since being shot by Taliban militants in 2012 for promoting education for girls. She met with Pakistan's prime minister in Islamabad and said she had longed for a homecoming. For the last five years, I have dreamed that I can set foot in my country. Whenever I traveled by plane or car, I see the cities of London, New York. I was told, just imagine you were in Pakistan. It was never true. But now, today, I see. I am very happy. The visit is taking place under heavy security and is expected to last for several days. Back in this country, a Maryland appeals court agreed on a new trial for a man whose murder case was featured in the NPR podcast, Serial. Adnan Syed has spent almost 20 years in prison for the killing of an ex-girlfriend. Today's ruling upheld a lower court that vacated Syed's conviction because his lawyer failed to cross-examine a key witness. And Wall Street closed out a volatile week. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 254 points to close at 24,103. The Nasdaq rose 114 points, and the S&P 500 added nearly 36. The markets will be closed tomorrow for Good Friday. Still to come on the news hour, I speak to now former VA Secretary David Shulkin. Unrest in Sacramento after a controversial police shooting. The New Orleans mayor on his new book about confronting the South's Confederate past. 
and much more. President Trump's cabinet and staff purge continued yesterday with the firing of Veterans Affairs Secretary David Shulkin. Mr. Trump announced on Twitter that his White House physician, Navy Rear Admiral Ronnie Jackson, would be nominated for the job Dr. Shulkin held for three years. Shulkin's ouster had been rumored for some time. It came after an ethics investigation over some questionable travel and expense issues, and after reported internal strife at the agency over the outsourcing of medical care to private providers. Dr. Shulkin criticized the administration this morning in the New York Times, alleging he was fired because he disagreed with plans to privatize much of the VA's functions. It is the government's second largest department, with more than 300,000 employees and an annual budget of $200 billion. I spoke with Dr. Shulkin just a short time ago about why he was forced from his job. I was simply told that he wanted to make a change. And of course, as a cabinet member, you serve at the pleasure of the president. So that's all that I was told. And why do you, th why do you think you were removed? Well, I think that the president has uh, strong feelings about the way that he wants the cabinet made up. And this was a personal decision that he felt more comfortable going a different direction. And I certainly respect that decision. You said in an interview earlier today with NPR that uh, the political appointees at the Veterans Administration uh, wanted to speed up, in effect, privatization. And they wanted to do it so much that they undermined what you were trying to do in reforming uh, the VA. Who are these people and, and what exactly were they doing? Well, I think there's no doubt that uh, when I became secretary, I made it clear that uh, the Veterans Administration should not be a political department, that it was important that we do things in a bipartisan way. I believe that's essential for our national security and to get things done. And uh, people that came on to the Department of Veteran Affairs as political appointees after the election, uh, I believe, uh, wanted to see the department move further towards privatization and not remain in a, in a bipartisan, moderate approach, and uh, therefore saw me as a threat to their political philosophy. But you were already moving, uh, had moved the department in that direction, as you say. Um, a number of, uh, of the services provided by the VA were contracted out to private entities. What more did they want? Did they want full privatization? I mean, can you describe for us what, what they're asking for? Yeah, absolutely. As you know, Judy, I joined uh, the administration under President Obama, and I've been consistent from the day I've started that in order to fix the problems in the Department of Veteran Affairs, that it can't do it alone. It needs to work with the private sector. And I've consistently driven us to, towards strengthening the VA internally at the same time and working closer with our private sector partners. What I think that the political appointees wanted to see is, is not to strengthen the VA and just to increasingly allow veterans uh, unfettered access to the private sector to be able to go there whenever they wanted it, which of course uh, is, a, is a noble goal, but we have nine million American veterans that we're caring for, and we have to make sure that we're honoring our responsibility to them, and that means also investing and in keeping the VA a strong organization. Well, I guess some of this is hard to understand because President Trump has talked repeatedly about wanting to strengthen the VA, wanting better services for our veterans. But you're saying he's, in, a, in essence, he's sided with the folks who you say are going to weaken what the VA is doing. No, I, I, you know, I think you're right. The president's been very consistent that he wants to see the situation improve for veterans. And I believe I was uh, following his instructions and we were making that progress. I think that um, these political appointees uh, have agendas of their own and were pushing uh, in a direction that didn't necessarily come directly from the president. And you well, know, this was, a, this was a concern that I tried to address inside the organization. But, um, but you know, I think that uh, the political chaos just got to be so much that the president felt that he needed to go in a different direction. But, but he sided with them, didn't he, in removing you? 
Well, I think ultimately uh, they wanted to see a change in the secretary and the president ultimately made that decision. But I don't believe that there was uh, direct communication between these political appointees and the president. Do you think your successor, Dr. Ronnie Jackson, or don't you believe that he's going to be moving in the direction that those political appointees want, moving faster toward privatization? I have never talked to Dr. Jackson about his policy or political issues on this. But I certainly hope that he's going to continue the work that I've been doing to move the department to transform it in a better way. And I will certainly do everything that I can to help Dr. Jackson succeed in that role. I think what may be unclear to people watching who don't follow some of these issues very closely is, I mean, you referenced in your piece in the New York Times today, you said you're convinced that privatization is a political issue aimed at rewarding select people and companies with profits even if it undermines care for veterans. So there's something uh, underhanded going on here. It, it, can you name some of these companies or people who would profit? I just don't see privatization as a good thing for veterans. And I think that those that are uh, really sticking to a political ideology or doing this for other reasons, like financial reasons, uh, don't have the interests of veterans at heart. And I think you just have to talk to the veterans groups to hear that. And that's something that I did as secretary. I stayed very close to those who represent the 9 million Americans who get their health care in VA and the many more million veterans who get their services and benefits through VA. And I think that um, the people that are pushing towards privatization are really uh, representing only a small minority of veterans in this country. One other thing, um, uh, David Shulkin, and that is the inspector general at the Veterans Administration found that uh, in that trip you took to Europe last year that there were expenses that you uh, basically made the government pay for that they said should have been personal. You mentioned the chaos a minute ago. Did your own actions contribute uh, to what happened here ultimately? Well, Judy, let's talk about that. This was a, uh, a, a meeting that's been going on for 43 years that every VA secretary has attended uh, with 40 hours of, of interaction with our allies who fight all the wars together. And the only uh, government expense was a single coach airfare for my wife who was invited uh, to this conference. She's a physician. And that was approved by our ethics department. Everything was done exactly how it should have. Uh, six months later, the inspector general found that a staff member had not done the paperwork correctly. And when uh, that report came out, I paid every penny of that coach airfare back. So uh, I think that this was really all about the politics and uh, really not about the substance of the issue. Finally, has President Trump spoken with you since this happened? No. David Shulkin, the former Secretary of Veterans Affairs, thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Tensions continue to run high in Sacramento, California. Today, almost two weeks after city police killed a young African-American man during an investigation into local vandalism. Stefan Clark was shot dead in the backyard of a family member's home. His funeral was this afternoon. Yamis Alcindor has our report. You thought I was worth saving. Gospel music echoed and tears flowed as family and friends gathered at Stefan Clark's funeral to say a final goodbye. I always come down to bug him, be like, what do you want to be when you grow up? He told me, only thing he ever wanted to be is a great dad. Delivering his eulogy alongside Clark's brother, Reverend Al Sharpton pushed back against the White House's claim that the shooting is, quote, a local matter. No, this is not a local matter. They've been killing young black men all over the country. And we are here to say that we're going to stand with Stephon Clark and the leaders of his family. It's time for us to go down and stop this madness. Stephon Clark's confrontation with police came on March 18th. The male subject that broke some car windows is now hiding in the backyard of this address. After reports of a man in a hoodie vandalizing cars, a police helicopter with an infrared camera spotted the 22-year-old. 
two officers, one white, one black, confronted Clark outside his grandparents' home. Their body camera footage showed them cornering Clark and shouting that he had a gun. All told, they fired 20 shots. But Clark had been holding a cell phone, not a gun. The killing quickly sparked unrest that at times has brought parts of Sacramento to a near standstill. On Tuesday, Clark's brother Savante marched into a city council meeting and jumped up on the dais in front of Mayor Daryl Steinberg. Chief of police got my brother killed. He Enough. doesn't care. He shows no emotion at all. Yesterday, Savante Clark issued an apology to the mayor. Later at the funeral, he was visibly distraught. I am! There have also been angry demonstrations preventing fans from entering Sacramento Kings basketball games. In turn, the players on Sunday wore warm-up t-shirts with slogans that said, accountability, we are one, and hashtag Stefan Clark. Meanwhile, police chief Daniel Hahn announced California's Becerra attorney general will oversee the investigation into the shooting. Our city is at a critical point right now, and I believe this will build, help build faith and confidence in the investigation from our community. Sworn in last August, Hahn is Sacramento's first black police chief. He took over as the city adopted major reforms after the 2016 police killing of Joseph Mann, a mentally ill black man. Clark's death has reignited the national debate on race and policing and follows other recent high-profile cases. They include the deaths of Eric Garner in New York, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, and Samuel DeBose in Cincinnati. In each case, police were either not charged or charges were dropped. This week, the state of Louisiana also announced it will not charge two white officers in the shooting death of Alton Sterling. He died in a struggle outside a Baton Rouge convenience store in 2016. Back in Sacramento, there have been appeals for calm, but officials are bracing for new protests. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Yami Shalsendor. For more on all this, I am joined by Benjamin Crump, the attorney for Stefan Clark's family. Thanks for joining me. At Stefan Clark's funeral today, his brother seemed visibly shaken. Talk to me a little bit about this family's grief and the grief of so many families that you've represented. Well, Yamish, yeah, mean, it's very, very emotional, as you would imagine having to bury a loved one, a brother, a son, a grandson, a father, who was killed in the backyard of the house that they all grew up in. Um, it's just so emotional, especially for his grandmother, who her bedroom is less than five feet away from where her grandson was executed. So they're, they're dealing with emotions and grieving in their own unique ways. And the city released video that we just showed of Stefan Clark's last moments. There are some who have watched that video and said he should have surrendered to police and followed their instructions. What do you make of people who ask those questions? And what do you see from a legal perspective when you watch that video? Well, when I watch the video, I see, number one, that Stefan Clark had no weapon. He had no gun. He was no threat to the police. He was running from the police. The police gave him no warning. They gave him no identification of who they were. And they also gave him no humanity after they executed him. I mean, they shot him 20 times. And when you think about that, they could have done so many things differently that was within their policy to, than to use the most lethal use of force possible, an execution. And so for those people who say, well, this happened because he ran from the police, well, what about other instances where non-minorities and non-African Americans actually murdered people in schools, actually put bombs in people's houses in Austin, Texas. The police followed them for hours, and yet they didn't shoot not one bullet, but an unarmed African American man with a cell phone is unjustifiably and unnecessarily executed by police bullets. Now, this killing has ignited kind of a new national conversation about this. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders was asked about this. She said Stefan Clark's shooting death um, was a local matter and that such incidents should be, held, should be handled by local authorities. What do you think of her comments? I think they're very problematic and troubling. We need our leaders to see young African-Americans, especially young African-American men, as part of the American fabric and the fact that 
in the last two years, 75 African-American men have been killed by police unarmed. Now, that's a problem not just here in Sacramento, not just in uh, Chicago, Illinois with Laquan McDonald, not just with Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio, not with Terrence Crutcher, who had his hands up on video with the helicopter overhead in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It is an American problem, and we have to solve this problem together if our society is ever going to heal. And you mentioned uh, several different cities where incidents have happened. In Sacramento, they've they've released the video pretty quickly after Stephon Clark died. Um, the the mayor there has also said that he's going to look at policing practices and look at police training. Uh, the, the investigation is still ongoing, but has the city of Sacramento's actions at all started to address the, the Clark family's concerns? Well, yes and no. The, they are very happy that the police tried to be transparent somewhat by releasing the video. However, you must remember the day after his execution, they put out a narrative that we believe was false that says Stefan Clark had a gun. That's why they had to execute him in the manner they did. Then they walked that back, and then the next day they said that well, Stefan Clark had a toolbar or a crowbar, and that's why they had to execute him. And then they walked that back, and then finally they came clean and said he had no weapon at all. All he had was a cell phone. Well, thank you so much for joining me. We're definitely going to be following this case closely, and I appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you, Yamish. City officials, in particular the mayor of Sacramento and the police chief, have been the focus of much of the public's outrage. Hari Srinivasan has that perspective. Daryl Steinberg has been the mayor of Sacramento since 2016. He joins me now. Uh, mayor Steinberg, first just to, to address the concern uh, that Mr. Crump just had. Why the different narratives uh, so soon, soon after the shooting? Well, uh, the investigation is uh, just beginning here. And, you know, I know sometimes uh, in the moments and days after a horrific event like this, there's a lot of information that, uh, that gets out that, that uh, may or may not be the case. But I want to tell you that um, we are not going to wait until the end of the investigation here in Sacramento to do a thorough review of the policies, the protocols, and the training. It's one thing uh, to uh, not prejudge whether or not these officers acted within the scope of the policy, uh, the law, and the training. But it's a whole other thing to ask whether or not the protocols and the trainings themselves need to be corrected. And we're going to be very, very aggressive about this because regardless of whether or not uh, there was legal, will be legal culpability here, the outcome was just plain wrong. A 22-year-old young man like this should not have lost his life in this way. And so uh, we are yeah. going to be diligent. Yes. Well, Mayor Steinberg, uh, with respect, unfortunately, this is not a new occurrence. There are cities around the country that have tackled this, that have tried to figure out what sorts of policy prescriptions that they could make to recover and maybe prevent this from happening again. So what's taken Sacramento so long? Well, Sacramento is actually in some ways on the forefront. We have one of the most progressive video release policies in the country. Our chief released this video within three days of the shooting. A year and a half ago, our policy and the policies throughout the country are rarely, if ever, to release video. We're one of the first cities to have all of our officers actually equipped with body cams. And so... Mm -hmm. Uh, we, have a lot, we have a lot more work to do. There's no question about it. I mean, certainly the question is, is there not a better way? And the answer has to be, yes, there has to be a better way. And, and the better way is around de-escalation. It's sure. around uh, le less lethal force. Of course it is. But, uh, and that's exactly what we're going to pursue. Mr. Mayor, if it wasn't for the death of uh, Joseph Mann in that case two years ago, you wouldn't have had this body cam video release policy. I, I know this is an ongoing investigation, but why did the officers in this particular case press the mute button on those cameras, and why can't we hear what's on that tape? I don't know. Uh, certainly there's a lot of audio that you can hear, but uh, it was turned off at some time, and that's a question that I have that the community has and will be answered in the investigation. Certainly the, the question we'll be asking at our, our next public hearing is simply, is it ever appropriate to mute a body cam? If the answer to that question is no, I think we'll already have the answer. But um, 
We're going to ask that question, certainly, as one of the key troubling aspects of the case. Mayor, you've also said that you don't believe your police are racist, but you do think that implicit bias might have played a role in this. So are you willing to implement implicit bias training for your officers like, say, Indianapolis did after uh, the shooting that they had of Aaron Bailey last year? We're already starting, and absolutely, uh, we are going, we must intensify our implicit bias training because, uh, look, at here's what I know. I have a 21-year-old son. Um, I never would have thought of having to tell him as a teenager to keep his hands in the 10-2 driving position if he were approached by a police, uh, stopped by a police officer while driving his car. That is what African-American mom and dads have to do uh, with their kids. And, it, and from all strata of society, I hear this from everybody, implicit bias, of course, is real. And to deny it is to not do everything we have to do to prevent this from happening. Oh, finally, Mayor Steinberg, um, you know, you had a 10 year old kid testify at City Hall that he was scared of police. He was pointing to this case in tears and saying 20 shots over a cell phone. How do you deal with kind of that deep seated problem? You take this moment and you turn it into a movement. You, you take the anguish, the trauma and the pain and you make real change. Sacramento has a, has a wonderful civic culture. And if there's any yep. city that could turn this horrific event into permanent and real change, it's the capital city of California. And that's exactly what we intend to do. All right, Mayor Daryl Steinberg of Sacramento, thanks so much. Thank you. Stay with us coming up on the news hour. Big money in the sneaker business. American Indian history intertwined with our culture today. And a brief but spectacular take from the journalist behind the New York Times hit podcast, The Daily. But first, we talk to another mayor who has had to confront a troubling history of racism in his city. Mitch Landrieu spearheaded the removal of four Confederate monuments in New Orleans. He recounts the cultural and political battle to bring them down in a new book, In the Shadow of the Statues. We spoke earlier today, and, I began, and he began his response to the situation in Sacramento. It's a very painful example, again, that we haven't gotten it right yet in the country. First of all, most law enforcement officers show up for work, they put their lives on the line, they risk their lives. But there have been too many examples over the years of police officers not being properly trained, trained to shoot first and ask questions later, and then there's a lot of gray area. But one of the things that's been universally true over the past couple of years that we've been dealing with is how to investigate these things so that the community feels like there's been an honest assessment of whether or not it was done appropriately or not. And I know that they're going through this in Sacramento. We used to go through this in New Orleans a lot. We have been under federal consent degree for eight years. All of our police officers now uh, wear body cams. Um, every time there's a police involved shooting, the area gets cardened off. We have independent folks that are not on the police department that help investigate the matter so the public knows about it. But clearly, um, there is a rupture that has, has existed between police departments and the community, and you have to work really hard to put that back together. When you came up with the idea a couple of years ago after talking to Wynton Marsalis uh, of taking down Confederate statues, you met with enormous opposition. I certainly did, but I want to put this in context for the, for the country. You know, as, as, as uh, New Orleans suffered from the effects of Katrina and then Rita and then Ike and then Gustav and then the BP oil spill and the recession, we were in the midst of rebuilding the entire city. Um, and as we built the hospitals in the riverfront, we were thinking about well, how we're we going to get ready for our 300th anniversary, which allowed us to really think about where we had been and what we were doing. And the public spaces came into full view. So when I asked Wenton, who, as you know, is not only a great musician, but a great historian to help me curate the 300th anniversary, he said, you really ought to think about taking those statues down because they don't reflect who we are. And have you ever thought about them? from my perspective or from the perspective of the African-American community. And of course, that set off uh, an explosion in my head and I started thinking about why they were there. And that really kind of began the process of, of you know, suggesting to the city that we take them down. And ultimately they came down last year, but not without, it became a national mm, discussion. Correct. Was, the president got involved at one point. Yeah, he, he said sure it's did. sad to see the history and culture of our great country being ripped apart yeah. by taking down these. Well, that's really interesting because these Confederate uh, monuments were actually put up well after the Civil War ended. 
And of course, everybody knows or, or should be able to uh, acknowledge that the Civil War was, was fought to destroy the United States of America, not to unite it. And it was fought for the cause of slavery. And it shouldn't be hard to say that. And so what I say in the book is I make a distinction between having these monuments up in places of reverence where we can revere these men for what they did because what they did was wrong and remembering what they did so that we never repeat it. And I think it's a very important step in uh, the process that the country has to go through for racial reconciliation. And, and yet, it's 150 years after this country fought that civil war. It's 50 Correct. years after the civil rights movement. Correct. Why did it take so and, and long? And it's a couple of years after we had an African-American president. Yes. Uh, which goes to the big point. The fact that the speech that I gave actually resonated across the country means that we have a problem that hasn't been reconciled. And we have not really done a good job of it. And so whether it's police community relations, whether it's other particular issues that we're confronting, we have to work through this issue of race that we obviously have not worked through very well. We, the country keeps dealing with it in different ways. Well, we don't. The truth is we don't deal with it at all. We act like, oh, we had the Civil War, we had civil rights, let's get over it and let's move behind. And the African-American community is saying, wait a minute, we have more to talk about and we have more to do. And, and there are tons of examples of it. But one of the things that the book tries to do is create an open invitation for people to rethink their history and to, and to reflect on whether or not the history that was told was actually the true history, much less the whole history. And I think that when they do that, they will recognize it as a country that diversity is a strength for America, not a weakness. And of course, some people want to relitigate that right now. And I think we have to restate it very clearly so people know where we stand. Is that being heard right now in New Orleans and in the state of Louisiana? I well, mean, are people accepting this? We're now? certainly talking about it a lot now. And I think a lot of people are being moved to think about it because when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes, it gives you a chance to see the world a little bit differently. So I'm hoping people will really think through it. I quoted some of what the president said about the idea of taking down these Confederate statues. He was very much against it. How has he changed or affected the conversation around race in this country? Well, he's certainly not the cause of our problems, but he is a symptom of them. And his uncareful uh, language that he uses helps exacerbate it. He has given uh, people who are avowed white supremacists you know, the feeling that now is the time for them to come out of the shadows and speak forcefully to the notion that whites are actually better than African Americans and that this nationalism and nativism that is manifesting itself is okay. And I just think that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, a conservative or a liberal, one of the things we ought to agree about in America as Americans is that there is no room for white nationalism in the United States of America. That has taken people into very dangerous places historically, not only in this country and in other countries. And we can argue about whether or not we want to approach the world through tax cuts or what our positions on war and peace and all of that stuff is, but on, on white nationalism and the notion that somehow white people are superior to brown people or black people, that is not who we are as Americans. That's not who we aspire to be. Your term as mayor is up in May of this year. A lot of conversation already about whether you're going to run for president in 2020. What is your thinking about it? Well, first of all, I don't intend to do that. I'm coming to the end of a 30-year career, and I've been blessed to, to, in the last eight years, serve in one of the great cities of all time. And I'm very thankful to the public for everything they've done to help us stand up and, of course, to celebrate our 300th anniversary. Um, I, I, I hear the chatter, but everybody's just desperate to think about what's coming next because I think people are tired of the chaos that we have. But there are going to be lots of other people that are going to do that. I don't intend to do that right now. Uh, in politics, as you know, you never say never. You don't know what the future holds, but that's not something that I'm planning on doing. What do you think, finally, the pluses and minuses are for a Southerner, a Southern Democrat uh, in 2020 uh, coming off this administration? You know, it's interesting. Um, we always try to guess what's going to come next, and everything turns out to be completely unpredictable. Nobody could have predicted President Obama. Nobody could have predicted President Trump. And, as you know, as being a veteran uh, journalists that something's going to happen that we don't have any idea about relating to a, uh, a world crisis, uh, man-made, and it's going to change the way people think. And so I think it's way too early to try to game that out at this point in time. Well, we thank you for coming in. Mitch thank Landrew, you. mayor of New Orleans. The book is In the Shadow of Statues, A White Southerner Confronts History. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now to the world of collectible sneakers, where buyers pay hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars for limited edition shoes. Tonight, our economics correspondent, Paul Salmon, profiles two so-called sneaker heads, one a major collector, the other a seller. It's part of his series, Making Sense, which airs every Thursday. 
This is 3,000 pair of sneakers. Mark Mayer Farisi has been collecting sneakers for so long, he needs more than this basement to house his hallowed 3,600 pair collection. You know, the storage unit, the apartment, the house, is probably a million dollars of sneakers. At New York Sneaker Con, we covered the billion dollar secondary market for sneakers. 20,000 sneakerheads buying and selling rare kicks for hundreds, even thousands of dollars. You have change? We pointed out the drivers of this market, brand loyalty, alternative identity, aesthetics, and perhaps above all, status. Mayor Farisi is a vivid case in point. I'm the Imelda Marcos of the hood, because you know how she had all the shoes and I have all the sneakers. <laughs> Mayor is an influencer. People want what he endorses, in part because they drool over his collection. There was an episode on Entourage one day where Turtle wanted a pair of sneakers that were unobtainable and they were online and they couldn't get it. And then Vince made a phone call and he got him a special shoe. 5,000. For sneakers? They're not just sneakers, E. They're wearable art. I made you an even more limited edition. Only one of one. This is also the Entourage shoe, but instead of Turtle's name on it, it has my name, it says Mayor. This is real crocodile. Crocodile? This is croc. This is a $2,000 Air Force One. This was the price on it. This was the last time that Nike ever used exotic materials on a shoe. Mayer has got 28 pairs. I have the only ones in existence. These are unobtainable. You can't get them. Obtaining the unobtainable hikes Mayer's status in sneaker culture. How does he get the kicks? From friends and connections who sell him limited releases at retail, but Nike and other brands also give them to him for free. The fact that I'm popular because of sneakers, a lot of companies capitalize on that and they want to give me product because they know I'm going to post it on social media or I'm going to wear it and I'm going to be seen in it. At age 45, Mayor Farisi may seem an unlikely market leader for teenage sneakerheads. But he says... I became the OG. I became the... the o what is OG? The original gangster, original gentleman, whatever they call it. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a term of endearment for older people. I only have 151,000 followers on Instagram. But my 150, 151,000 followers are core. They follow me because I'm mayor and they love what I love. So I have a cult following. And that cult following means a lot to a lot of brands. And it's not just sneaker brands that get exposure. This is a Louis Vuitton Supreme yes. pillow. Yes. How much is this thing worth? Uh, they sold for $600. They're probably going for $2,500 a pop now. Louis Vuitton was not selling them to the general public. I winded up with every piece in the collection. So I pride myself on that. Then there's his Rolex collection. I like these nice things because I couldn't afford them as a kid. I grew up very poor. I'm talking cereal with water, not milk, mayonnaise sandwiches, wishing I had, uh, you know, ham and cheese on it. I mean, you know, my mom did what she could do, single parent. And, you know, when I finally made something with my life and did something with my life, like, these are, these are my trophies. And you always wanted them because it would be a sign that you weren't poor. Right. It all started for sneakers with me. My mother bought me a cheap pair of sneakers called the Mark V. When it's the bottom of the ninth and he's digging for home, he wears the rugged Mark V from Sneaker Circus. It's a division of Spalding. It was a cheap, cheap sneaker. I thought I was cool because my name is Mark. I go back to the neighborhood. I got ridiculed, laughed off the block. Really? Like I mean, laughed off to the block to the point where I was fighting. I was so angry and crying that there was fists flying. That's how angry I was. And I vowed that would never happen again. And that's where it became for me with my sneakers. How does he afford it all? So let me show you the world's best sneaker cleaning product on the planet. Farisi is a well-paid brand ambassador at SneakerCon for a sneaker cleaning product called Crep Protect. Keeping your sneakers clean is a, a, a must in the sneaker community because you always want to look fresh. You always want to look good. He also hosts digital videos, what up, runs his own marketing firm, Greatest all gigs that grew out of his love for sneakers. Power laces, all right. Mayer actually has the Back to the Future shoe, the Nike Air Mag. I think I paid $4,800 on the auction. It's probably selling for $15,000 right now. And even that's not his most prized pair. This is a Jordan 4, undefeated. This is one of the holy grails of sneakers. Uh -huh. 72 pair in existence, $25,000 this shoe is going for. You mean, I've, I've been offered 20,000 used off my feet. I can take this shoe, bend it and crack it in half like this, and somebody will still offer me $25,000, $18,000 for this shoe. Which may explain why he was willing to let me try them on. Can I just do it the way I do with normal sneakers? Yeah, or? you can slip in there. Go ahead, don't be afraid. There well, it's $25,000 sneakers. 
stand up and let me see. There you go. It matches the clothes. I, I tell you, I swear I would wear those. You would wear but them. I wouldn't I buy them. These undefeateds were going for $55,000 at New York consignment shop Stadium Goods. And that leads us to the second star of our story, sneaker reseller Young Run Z John, a.k.a. 23 Penny. Those not lucky enough to be mayor rely on the likes of Z, who got the reselling bug from his mom. She used to flip iPads. She used to flip iPads? Yes, sir, because there was a shortage of iPads being sent to China when it first released here in the U.S. So what we would do, what, we would go to Circuit City, we would go there in the morning and wait on the iPad, and then she would send all those to China. Z has been reselling since he was 18 online, and now also from a showroom outside Nashville, which doubles as his warehouse. He sells almost $2 million worth a year. And where did these come from, for example? I can't quite tell you that exactly, Paul. Because that's your trade secret? That's my trade secret, yes. Resellers like Z are notorious for snapping up the latest sneakers as soon as they get to stores, before the public has a shot as he acknowledged in a documentary. For the people who think I'm a villain, I just want to let them know that I'm trying to be the best villain there is. Why are you the bad guy? I'm the bad guy because while everyone else is wanting a chance to buy a pair of sneakers for retail price, I'm sitting here with a good amount of sneakers that I've gotten that you know other people might not really even have access to. The sneaker market has created a technical competition of its own, featuring bots, for example, computer programs that complete an online purchase in the blink of an eye. When Joe Schmoke is on his phone on adidas.com at 10 o'clock, he's typing in all his credit card information digit by digit and his billing address, and the guy with the bot, he is buying 10 pairs at a time in a matter of nanoseconds, and when Joe Schmoke gets done, the shoe has already sold out. Right, and then this is, happens with Broadway shows, for example, and there are all these then counter algorithms to right. try to, are you a human as opposed right. to a bot? That's why we have resellers like me who have access to a lot of the goods that people have trouble accessing and whatnot. So that way, uh, you know, they'd rather just now pay the extra and, and you know, it's hassle-free. But you're like the person who is reselling Hamilton tickets, but you got the Hamilton tickets because you knew somebody who knew somebody who had gotten tickets, as opposed to having a bot that bought up all the Hamilton tickets right. on Broadway for right. the next so, yeah, six I, months. So yeah, in a sense, I'm still a ticket scalper, but I'm doing it. My, my approach to that is different. A ticket scalper with a shoe for even the unlikeliest of customers. Look at that. That's, that's a carpe diem look right there. And I actually bought two pair for a few hundred dollars. For the PBS NewsHour, this is economics correspondent Paul Salman reporting from Nashville and New York. Now a change of pace. History, mythology, imagery. A museum exhibition opens our eyes to the symbols of Native American life and culture all around. Jeffrey Brown has our story. A 1948 Indian brand motorcycle, one of the sleekest machines you're likely to see. Clothing with the logo for your local sports team. And perhaps in your refrigerator right now, a box of Land O'Lakes butter. She's on her knees and she's holding the box that she's on, so it recedes into infinity. So there's something really profoundly weird going on. Even more profound, just how pervasive native imagery is, embedded into the American subconscious. That's according to Paul Chot Smith, a member of the Comanche <laughs> tribe and co-curator of an exhibition at the National Museum of the American Indian. It's really this paradox that the country, 330 million people today, 1% of that population is Native American. For most people, they don't see or really think about Indians, yet they're surrounded by Indian imagery, place names, and have connections with Indians on a kind of deep emotional level. Whether we know it or not. Whether you, you know it or not. Yeah. We studied native dance. To that end, the exhibition is titled simply Americans and shows us Indians everywhere in all aspects of life. Overhead, a prototype of the Tomahawk missile on loan from the nearby Air and Space Museum. 
On one large wall, clips from films and TV shows. A side room takes us through the strange history of Pocahontas, known but not really known by all. Around the gallery, headdresses everywhere, in signs and advertising. The image of the Native American or Indian, the museum uses the terms interchangeably, as a symbol of ruggedness or bravery. This one is of the action shot of where Pocahontas is trying to stop them. But often with no discernible connection to the products, as in ads over the decades for calumet baking powder. An Indian a feather headdress has nothing to do with baking powder. It's a completely artificial connection, yet it somehow works because I think it, it talks about a kind of Americanness and quality that people say, okay, well that baking powder is probably pretty good because there's an Indian in a headdress on it. And note that it's red, white, and blue yeah. headdress. A history of extermination and appropriation of lands, and yet an embrace of American Indians as a symbol of something authentically American. There's certainly um, explicitly racist imagery, but it's a pretty small minority of it because the whole way that Indians have been objectified in the United States is about a kind of noble Indian idea, which is a different kind of caricature than one that's you know, explicitly vicious and that we're dirty and backward and unintelligent. But obviously it is, even though it's flattering in some way, it's still another kind of a stereotype. It's also, of course, about images and myths and not about the actual people themselves. By 1903... Smith says this distinction began in the late 19th century after the protracted armed conflict between natives and settlers and later the U.S. Army had come to an end. It was like there was a big meeting of the American collective unconscious to say, now we're going to freeze Indians in the past. The actual Indians are on reservations you know, in 1895 or 1910, or the actual Indians who might be living in L.A., you know, uh, living lives like the other people in Los Angeles, mm. they're not going to appear in entertainment. One area of continuing contention, sports names and logos. In recent years, some schools and universities have stopped using Native American nicknames. Earlier this year, Major League Baseball's Cleveland Indians announced they'll stop using the cartoonish Chief Wahoo logo on their uniforms, but they're keeping the Indians' name. More controversially, the National Football League's Washington Redskins are keeping their name. Smith is a fan of his local team, but not its name, though he understands the strong feelings. I have great empathy for fans, especially here in D.C., but fans don't choose the name of the team, right? A rich owner chooses it, and in the case of these names, it usually goes back to, you know, a century sometimes. I get why people aren't pleased when someone like me comes in and says, you know, this name is a dictionary-defined slur, as it is in D.C. But if you come in and try to take it away from somebody, I get that that's, you know, you, you feel attacked. No one would name a team the Redskins anymore, but not long ago, Victoria's Secret dressed model Carly Kloss like this, only to apologize after criticism. The museum wants people to think about the images around them and what they convey. Visitors are encouraged to write of their own experiences. Look at this one. I had a dream catcher over my bed as a kid. Why? I think what the show's designed to do is to say, you're not alone with these stories. And for the country as a whole, Smith says, there's something more at stake. There's this challenge to the United States idea of itself to have to acknowledge that the United States National Project came about at great cost to Native people. So what do we think about that? That's what this exhibition is saying. How do we come to terms with that? Should Americans just feel guilty? I don't think so. All Americans inherit this. How do we make sense of it? And a starting point is kind of looking at Indians in everyday life. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. And now our weekly Brief But Spectacular series, where we ask people about their passions. Tonight, journalist Michael Barbaro, he's the host of the New York Times podcast, The Daily, which is currently among the top three most downloaded shows on iTunes.
When I was a political reporter at the Times, you'd have all these moments where you wish that a camera crew or an audio team were with you. It was 2011, and I was in the Las Vegas hotel of real estate developer Donald Trump. His wife, Melania, was in the nearby bedroom wearing a bathrobe because he asked me to meet her. and She was feeling reticent about it because she was wearing a bathrobe. And he just said some of the, the most extraordinary things. The one I remember best being that the way he thought about same-sex marriage was how he thought about whether to use the new kind of putter that men were using in golf. And he said, I, I can't kind of can't wrap my head around using this. I can't make that change. And that was what he compared to his relationship to same-sex marriage. He kind of wasn't there yet. My biggest objection to the kind of contemporary form of news and news storytelling is that it often feels like the story, whether it's a TV segment or a radio news segment or a newspaper story, it's kind of beginning in the middle. There's a government shutdown. There's a crisis in Myanmar. There's a ballistic missile that's being tested by North Korea. In almost every case, the real story requires the clock to start way, way earlier. And what the Daily does, I think uniquely, is say, no, 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 we are really going to start this story where you need it to begin to understand it. The thing we love to do is genuinely surprise people in the morning. So you've had three or four days of coverage of President Trump, of Congress, of the shutdown. Tomorrow you're going to wake up, we're going to tell you a 30-minute operatic tale of Tanya Harding and her entire life. The idea of The Daily was to change the relationship between the consumer of the news and the presentation of the news. We did an interview the night that the United States started to bomb Syria after it had determined that chemical warfare had been used on the Syrian people by Bashar al-Assad, and we called up one of our dearest colleagues, Helene Cooper, at home while she was reporting the story. And we asked her a pretty provocative question. Did these missile strikes on Syria by the US, did they mean that we're at war with Syria? And instead of filibustering or pretending that she knew the answer, Helene said, Michael, I just, I just don't know that. I don't have an answer to that. Inevitably, when you're transforming a story and making it human and, and generating all the intimacy of sound and letting someone really hear a journalist grappling with a story. Like you inevitably, you have a different relationship with that journalist. Your bond with them changes. Your understanding of their mind changes. And that relationship deepens. So that's the not-so-secret secret mission of The Daily. I'm Michael Barbaro, and this is my brief but spectacular take on The Daily. Great to have that, and you can watch additional Brief But Spectacular episodes on our website, pbs.org slash newshour slash brief. On the NewsHour Online, we follow up on last night's segment on the overuse of antibiotics with an explainer on the costs of drug resistance and where we go from here. That and more is on our website, pbs.org slash newshour. And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. You can join us online and again here tomorrow evening with Mark Shields and David Brooks. For all of us at the PBS News Hour, thank you, and we'll see you soon. PBS.